Hallelujah. We have come to give God praise, to give in our dance, and to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have done. Thank you. I have come to give back to you. I have come to say thank you, Lord. I have come to give back to you. Yes, we have come. I have come to say thank you, Lord. What have you come to do? I have come to give back to you. Yes, we have come to give back to you, oh Lord, for all you have done. We say thank you. I have come to say thank you, Lord. We have come to give back. I have come to give back to you. To return all the glory and adoration unto you back, oh Lord. I have come to say thank you, Lord. Take all the praise. Take all the praise. Take all the praise. Take all the praise. You deserve. Take all the praise. Take all the praise. To lift up my hands, I have come to say thank you, Lord, for all you have done in our life. We have come, I have come to lift up my hands to say thank you, Lord. I have come to say thank you, Lord. Oh, what have you come to do? You say, I have come. Lift up my hands. To lift my hands and worship and say thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. I have come to say thank you, Lord. Because I didn't weep over my family, I didn't cry over my children. We say thank you. I have come to lift up my hands. To lift my hands and worship and say thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. I have come to say thank you, Lord. Thank all the praise. Inside is the winning side. We are more than conqueror because we are more than victorious. Yes, Lord. I have come to give you a shout. I have come to say thank you, Lord, because I am a winner. And the winning side is just that I have come to give you a shout. I have come. To say thank you, Lord. Declare it and say it a minute. You have come. I have, I have come, come to give you a shout. Because you are a winner. Woo! You can give me a shout. Yes, Lord. I have come to say thank you, Lord. Say it one more time. Say, I have come to give you a shout. You say, I have come to give you a shout.
Because I'm grateful, yes, Lord. I have come to say thank you, Lord. You have come to give you your dance. Say it one more time. Say, I have come. I have come to give you a dance. I have come to say thank you, Lord. Take all the praise. Take all the praise. Take all the praise. Oh Lord, we believe that you are here. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence, oh Lord. Yeah, in your presence, let it rain for your rain. Let it fall on me. We are here. 
presence Heavy rain All your rain Heavy fall on all Hope in the flood gates In abundance Cause your rain To fall on us Hope in the flood gates In abundance
Father, we bless you. We magnify you, Jesus. Take all the praise, take all the glory, take all the honor and adoration in the name of Jesus. You are the Lord. That is your name. You will not share your glory with any man. So we bless you this afternoon. For this evening, we give you glory. Lord, accept our worship, accept our praise, accept the sacrifice of the fruit of our lips. Amen. This evening in the name of Jesus. And as we hear from your word, speak open doors Thank you. for us to be able to receive from you this evening in the name of Jesus. Not just the words, but the power that comes with it that will enable us to make changes in our lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for the choir. We thank you for the instrumentalists. We thank you for everyone else who has lifted up their voices, lifted up their efforts to make sure that the praise and worship of your people goes out. Lord God, that praises rise as incense unto you, Lord. We thank you for every one of us. And we say, accept all these sacrifices, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You are welcome to the redeemed Christian Church of God, Christ the Rock Chapel, a place where everyone can grow to their fullest in love, worship, and the word of God, and as a result are transformed into role models in society. We um, big welcome to everyone who is joining us in person and online for our weekly midweek bible study and we look forward to having a wonderful time in the presence of the lord as we discuss the book onward engaging the culture without losing the gospel praise god today pastor Shion and i will continue our discussion on um onward and we've been looking at culture um, the last time we discussed this, we looked at the gospel application of culture. And we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21, which tells us, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we as our ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness of God. What was important was we realized that reconciliation means you are bringing people back to Christ. You are restoring creation to a right relationship with Jesus. Now, since we are discussed that since we are preaching a message of reconciliation, the tone of our message should be more of pleading or imploring people, not one of hostility to people. So the tone of our message is very, very important. And since we have the tone of reconciliation, that means that the other features of our gospel should be that of compassion, mercy, honesty, and respect. And I think I alluded to that little video clip. <clears throat> there was a little video clip that a comedian produced. And in that comedy, there was a man who saw another person, you know, he was 
engaging in roadside evangelism. And then he opened the Bible and shared the gospel with somebody. And that person told him he, he doesn't have time for his gospel. He's not interested. And then the guy pulled out an, an assault rifle and pointed it at the guy and said, you think I'm playing? I said, Jesus is coming soon. Give your life to Jesus now. And the guy knelt down right there beside the road and started saying, Jesus, I invite you to my heart. Now, the fact is that there is an urgency to spreading the gospel, but the tone, the approach we use is not one of, you know, coercion, but it's one of reconciliation, imploring or pleading with people to accept the gospel. So compassion, mercy, honesty, and respect are very, very important. Not one of, not hostility. Now, um, when we think about the word pleading, what synonym do we have? This is not a, an English lesson by any means, but um, can one of the ushers, do you have the microphone ready? So we're going to ask the people directly in front of me. Do you have any synonyms that you can think of for pleading? You know, words that have the same meaning as pleading. So, beg. beg. Okay, one is begging. Okay, go ahead. Appeal. Appeal. Okay, appealing. Any other word? Okay, so we have imploring. Okay, wonderful. Praise God. So pleading, um, imploring, and begging. And then appealing is also another word you can use. So all these words um, are the approach we should use in spreading the gospel. Now, do those terms have a positive or negative connotation to you and why? So somebody from our front, you, you, you gave one example. People gave one example. Those words you are using, do, 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 do those have a positive connotation? Do you think it's something positive to be begging somebody to accept Christ, to be appealing to somebody to accept Christ, to implore somebody to accept Christ? What Do you think that is a negative or positive um, implication or that, that does that have a negative or positive um, connotation to you? So somebody who answered the question originally, tell us whether you think that's positive or negative. <laughs> Depends. I'll just say it's positive because uh, if you are appealing, you are you are trying to humble yourself, so it should be positive. But it, it all depends all the same because uh, in the negative way it means that you are uh, you are expecting expecting something positive from it, but you are doing it in like uh, you are not like doing it with force. So okay. you are like you are like you know, put yourself in a different situation. You are like the one uh, you know, like having a negative impact on people, putting myself down. positive effect like person you are trying to make sure the person accept what you what you're saying praise god Hallelujah. so it's my, my take or, or my summary or, or my own personal summary of what you have said is that it's positive because it's a net positive even though there is there may be a connotation of negativity um i don't even think it's really negative negative honestly because from the word of God, the Bible says that whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and the person that humbles himself will be exalted. So the fact is that if you um, humble yourself, then God is going to exalt you in due season. Even if somebody may look down on you at that particular moment, you are still going to be exalted. So, um, let, 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 um, if, um, if Pastor Sean, what do you think? If I can jump in, um, I remember the story of a woman of God um, she's going to be with the Lord now, Pastor Bimbo Dukoya. 
she shared about when she worked at um, the National Theater and she was trying to minister to her colleagues. And she said, you know, she, they, they knew she was a Christian. She had shared Christ with them. But to emphasize her point, she said every time they all wanted to eat, you know, in the office and they needed somebody to get the food, she would always volunteer. And then whenever they are done with the food, she will volunteer to clean up. She will volunteer to clean the plates, to wash the plates. She used to volunteer for everything. And, you know, she made herself like the errand girl for the office, such that at the end of the day, both verbally and through her actions, she, she was um, ministering to them. So, you know, that's what came to my mind when we started talking about begging and pleading. You know, it's not just through our words. It's also through our actions and the way we live our lives because, you know, that po posture of humility really does take out of us. And I think you've um, already alluded to something which we're going to talk about a little later, but we might as well talk about it now um, briefly just as an introduction. We're going to get to that a little later. First Peter 2, 11 to 12 tells us, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So the fact is that even if somebody, based on the fact that you are a Christian, may be opposed to you, when they see your behavior or see your conduct, it makes it very, very difficult for them to speak against Christ because they see Christ in you. Even though the whole idea of a Christian is countercultural to many of these people. The first thing they'll say is, you know, wh wh why do you hate some particular sections of the, of, of, of the community? Or why do you, um, why are you guys uh, who are Christians homophobic, for example? Why are you um, against people who are, why, why, why are you guys why don't you people believe in enjoying yourselves the way we enjoy ourselves? Why are you against gambling? Why, don't, why are you against um, carousing? Why are you against partying? You know, they, 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 there are so many things that they will, they will, they, they, they will pick on which are countercultural. But the fact is that when they see your conduct, then it makes it very, very difficult to be able to... Um, continuously oppose you because there are some benefits to your behavior among them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But we'll come back to that. Now, what does, how does that affect the way we, the fact that we are pleading, how does that affect the way we engage the culture as a whole, our world around us? Well, you know, it, it informs how we interact with them, like I said earlier. Again, when you were talking, I, I remember one of our neighbors across the street. And, you know, he, num he, every trash day, he would take our trash from the street to, you know, he will move it to the garage door. And even when my parents were in town and stayed with us for a long time, my dad took it upon himself to be doing that. And it became something of a joke because it looked like they used to struggle for who could get the trash can at the same time. So he continued doing it. And then my dad would be like, well, but I want to do it while I'm around, you know. So it just informs how we interact with people that we want to show kindness and then with people who oppose us, people who, I think kindness is a universal language, you know, because it doesn't matter what, what the people you're trying to minister to, what they believe, what is op opposed, what, they are, what belief they have that's opposed to yours. Kindness is a universal language, you know, and so by doing less of arguing and, argue, you know, arguing about the topic and doing more of showing love and kindness that 
that's a better way of approaching, um, of approaching them. I think that's a better tool of reconciliation. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, we see that, like um, we have heard, kindness is a universal language. Love is a universal language. Hospitality is a universal language. Even though there may be language barriers, there may be um, socioeconomic barriers, there may be ethnic barriers, there may be racial barriers. Kindness, compassion, you know, love, hospitality, these simple things are things that we as believers can use to transcend any differences we may have with individuals. And in my own opinion, I think that what we are learning is that these have a greater effect, especially considering the fact that, look, whatever we are doing, we are doing in terms of eternity. When we realize that, okay, as especially those of us who are workers in the redeemed Christian Church of God, but for all of us as a whole, what are, is, is, is our vision? What are our goals as members of redeemed Christian Church of God? One, to make sure that each of us make heaven. And two, take as many people as possible with us to heaven. And to ensure that there's a member of the household of Jesus in every family of the world. So, in order to do that, in order to transcend all these barriers that could face you, barriers of language, barriers of, you know, culture, barriers of race, barriers of ethnicity, we as individuals need to be able to speak a universal language. So rather than us saying, okay, look, we want to make an impact, we think we can make an impact, which you can by legislation, mm -hmm. you know, by demonstration or demonstration, we can make also an impact through eternity by encouraging ourselves to harness compassion and mercy rather than frustration and anger. Remember the old proverb that says you attract more flies with sugar than salt. Or like Martin Luther King said, you know, because at, at that time, he was facing a, a, a situation of racial segregation that was kind of endemic throughout society. But, and there were different voices. Some were saying, you know, violence, you need to hit violence with violence. Well, he said something that, you know, hate cannot drive away hate. Only love can. So we have to, as individuals, faced with, you know, a society that is increasingly hostile and divided, we need to approach it with compassion and mercy instead of showing frustration and anger. Understand that while it may be important to try to harness change, social change, through legislation and demonstration, fundamentally, we are not seeking an earthly kingdom, but we are seeking to advance a heavenly kingdom. And we're going to see an example here. Pastor Shea was going to read Acts chapter 19, verse 21 to 41. Because we're going to read it from the beginning to the end. So please project that um, multimedia. And let's see um, Acts 19, 21 to 41. And see how um, the Apostle Paul was able to change the economy of Ephesus. Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go, to, go on to Rome. He sent his two assistants, Timothy and Erastus, ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a while longer in the province of Asia. Verse 23. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. 
He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worship throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of our great prestige. Verse 28, at this their anger boiled and they began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak. But when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again and kept it up for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges, and if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government. Since there is no cause for all this commotion, and if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them, and they dispersed. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the issue here is, what did Paul set out to do? The, the answer can be seen, I think, in, those, in the preceding chapters. So let's see what happened to Paul in verse 19 real quickly, just to uh, summarize it. He first came to Ephesus, then he found several believers, that's verse 1 and 2. We asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they replied. They didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. But they knew they had accepted Jesus. So he laid hands on them. And when he was all, first he baptized them. Then he laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were 12 in all. And then that started a change in that society. So then... Paul went to the synagogue for the next three months. He was arguing persuasively about the um, kingdom of God. Then some of the people in the synagogue basically kicked him out of the synagogue. So Paul left the synagogue, took some believers with him, and went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. You know, they set up their own little church plant over there. And they continued to preach the word for two years. So, of course, not only were a few things were happening. First, people were getting converted. Then, miracle signs and wonders were happening. You know, handkerchiefs and aprons were touching Paul. Or Paul would touch handkerchiefs and aprons. They would take them. They would heal the sick. Then, there were also... Um, um, Christians who were conducting deliverance sessions around in society. 
and they talked about some people who thought they they were like paul of course and the demons ended up dealing with them but the bible says that fear of the lord descended on that city and people who were practicing magic started burning their magic books several million dollars worth of books were burned and the bible says that verse 20 so the message about the lord spread widely and had a powerful effect so here we see that society was beginning to get transformed and there was no need to speak against the idol idolatrous religions of the day because society itself was being transformed as a result of the message of Christ and the fact that the kingdom of heaven was advancing. So, of course, what happens many times, people don't really mess with you until you mess with their money. <laughs> Once you start to mess with people's money, then it becomes a problem. So, here we have Demetrius. That's why I don't know if any of us will name our children <laughs> Demetrius now. But... <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Demetrius came and he started the riot. But what was behind, he admitted what was behind this riot it was because they were messing with their money. He, he cloaked it with all other things about, you know, the, 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 the goddess losing her honor and respect. But in reality, it was all about money. It was an economic fight. So, what does that tell us? That tells us a few things. That tells us that, look, we as believers can create social change simply by being aggressive about sharing the gospel. And when I say aggress aggression, I don't mean aggression in terms of person-to-person -person evangelism like I talked about. What I'm talking about aggression is aggression in our overall approach to the process of sharing the gospel that is if we can aggressively evangelize society then we can achieve social change without necessarily having legislation on our side without necessarily having to create demonstrations or disrupting actively seeking to disrupt society from a physical or informational standpoint we can actually just by sharing the gospel create change in society like we see here so the question is and that has answered the question that what does this incident teach us about the effect of kingdom advance but further what i would like to and we've already answered that question but now the next question is and we'll ask somebody from aside over here to my right can you relate the situation in Ephesus to any modern day issues of idolatry so like what happened in Ephesus can you relate that to any modern day idolatrous issues people confronting modern day idols with the power of the gospel Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, in the absence of any answer, I'll kick it open to everybody. Anybody has any example of people confronting modern day idols with the gospel? I think one of the um, <clears throat> things that come to mind is in some other countries, corruption. Because when you realize it, that what is the push behind corruption is basically the idol of money. People want to make money at all costs. So regardless of whether or not that money is legitimate or not, in a society that worships money or people that have money, then people resort to any means possible to try to make that money. And one of the ways that <clears throat> the gospel can combat corruption is 
by saying that basically that idol that's pushing corruption, if it's engaged, then you realize that the power of the gospel can start to transform a corrupt society. Another example is pornography. Now, unfortunately, one of the issues of the church is that the church is not doing as much as it needs to in combating this. Because, you know, like research showed, you know, basically, I, I think I may have talked about it once, that um, from the book Gods at War, the actual book, not the Bible study, you know, there were research into the old America online accounts as to how people, you know, how much websites people trafficked. And there have been questionnaires that come out and you realize that a significant portion of people who identify themselves as going to church actually <clears throat> regularly watch pornography during the week. So, the church cannot have the effect it's supposed to have. You can try to create legislation to try to solve this problem, but in reality, unless there is a change to the gospel, this industry will continue to thrive. Unless people accept the gospel in truth, these industries will continue to thrive. Praise God. Hallelujah. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Not particularly. You know, just um, in terms of, um, uh, I think recently something else that came up was the issue of the kind of books that our children are being given from the public school library. You know, originally, um, one of my daughters came home and said, oh, mommy, they are taking away Ruby Bridges from the school library. And I'm sure some, some of us remember Ru Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was the little girl that had to go to, uh, to a non-segregated school after they abolished segregation. And the, they were so hostile to her that she had to go to school almost the entire year accompanied by the U.S. Uh, marshals, the federal marshals, had to walk her to her from school. You know, so my children did projects in wax museums. One of them was Ruby Bridges. So we were all familiar with the story. And so when she, um, when she came home and said, oh, they are taking Ruby Bridges, I, I felt bad. I said, oh, that's unfortunate. But the next day, or a couple of days later, I realized that there were some other books that were in that category that I really didn't want my children reading. You know, books, explicit books that I could not believe were in school libraries for, for like um, even fifth, gr fifth graders, sixth graders, fourth graders. These were explicit books, alternative lifestyles, you know, teaching kids what to do and how to do, you know, so everything was all lumped together. And, you know, I asked myself, you know, if if not that Christians, you know, took a peek into the school libraries and realized, okay, this is not for our children, you know, just Christ in people sparked that change, you know, so thank God for that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, in addition, um, we look at that scripture we read earlier and the second part. It says, keep your, 1 Peter 2, verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, why do you think Peter described the church as sojourners and exiles? That's the question. So, we're going to go back to our, our people on our right because you haven't answered any question yet, people of God, so we'll give you another chance. <laughs> so, what, how do you think Peter described the church, or why do you think Peter described the church as sojourners and exiles? Okay. 
Okay, anybody else opening up to the floor? Why do you think Peter described the church as sojourners and exiles? Oh, praise God. So, over here. Over here. So I believe that. Praise God. Thank you very much, sir. The, the idea is, of course, that we are looking at it from a point of view of eternity. And I think that's a very, very important, um, important um, way of looking at ourselves. That, look, we have to view our conduct and our approach to this world from the point of view of eternity. That is, this earth is not our home. We are just sojourners. Praise God. And our focus is on heaven. Now, let's list examples of how Christians can be a distraction to the gospel in the way they conduct themselves. So, anybody from the right side again, tell us how you think Christians can be a distraction to the gospel in the way they conduct themselves. Praise God. True dressing. Oh. Dressing. Dressing could be like a distraction. Okay, so one example is the way we dress. Now, um, my assumption is that you mean that the way you dress in terms of you trying to appropriate the culture of this world into dressing is that correct or are you talking from another extreme which is that we can also dress in such a way that will be a distraction to the gospel being preached i think the other one you mentioned being a distraction like the fact that you you like kind of like dress too much or wearing things that is not allowed of the gospel, trying to make use of, like, the flesh over people, and people try to, like, try to emulate whatever they see, using, Pr like, the culture of the world of, to bring about the gospel. Praise God. Amen. So, we can be a distraction in the way we dress. Okay, anybody else from that side, can you give us another example of how we as Christians can be a distraction in the way we conduct ourselves. Okay. Praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Our conduct as Christians as well can be a huge distraction. Um, Christians in church, the way we conduct ourselves, our attitudes, and because we are the Bible that the world is reading, and we are the Bible that we are reading as well in this age that we are. Praise God. So my assumption is that in any, if in any way we do not conduct ourselves according to the scripture, then we're a distraction because people will see our behavior and they will wonder, they will try to reconcile our behavior with what the Bible says. Praise God. My sister. Yeah, I think certain gatherings um, could be a distraction. Um, some parties, some clubbing, like as a Christian, um, that could be saved. Um, a Christian that, that has been saved might think clubbing is not an issue. But those that are not saved will be looking at you, um, and you being in that setting, you being in that environment, may not really communicate that you are saved or you are a believer. So uh, certain environments, certain settings like parties, uh, could uh, be a distraction to the gospel. Praise God. Okay, all of us are looking, uh, t talking about it, but I want, I want to add something else. Yeah, I, you, I, I, oh, I have something. Go ahead. Which is, uh, um, there's an example of, um, of a youth pastor who I think either walked or lived close by a, a bar or a, a club, a strip club, and you know, because he walked or lived close by, he kind of got used to the girls that used to go to work in the strip club. 
And so he struck up a friendship enough to be able to invite a couple of them to church. And so one of them took him up on the offer and went to church. Well, <laughs> I don't know how some of the church people knew <laughs> because uh, if you don't go there, how do you know the people that walk there? But somehow they recognized the, the one girl that, you know, that took him up on the offer and they weren't very nice to her. And so she told him, you know, she appreciated him inviting her to the church, but she, she said she was not going to go back to church. So that's one example, the way that we, you know, how do we handle people that are in obvious, obviously sinful lifestyles? How do we handle them? You know, for instance, you, you might have, how do you handle your streets? Maybe you want to have an open house, a street party, lemonade, Thanksgiving cookie kind of thing and you're inviting everybody on the street to the party, but you, there's a couple, Steve and Steven, down the road. And, you know, how do you handle that? Do, do you invite them? Do you uninvite them? When they come, if you invite them, how do you treat them when they come? So those are things that we need to ask ourselves, because in that case, in, instead of you showing love and kindness, if you show, um, discrimination or hatred, then that behavior is a distraction to, um, to the gospel. You know, you, you know that this is what they do, and then that day you decide you're going to do a protest, and then you make your signs, and you say, not wanted on this street, this, you know, this lifestyle, not wanted, and everybody is singing and drumming and quoting the Bible, that's a distraction when you can be showing love and kindness. Praise God. Yes, and I think you, the, 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 the important thing that Pastor Shion has let us know is that, look, our stand on social issues, in the absence of the gospel being the primary driving force behind our stand, can be a distraction. Because if you now say, okay, look, and wh wh what I mean is we have to be careful, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but my point is that the Bible says that, you know, there's a way that people, the Apostle Paul was complaining that people embrace a form of the gospel, but deny the power behind it. That's what I'm talking about. If you are just trying to create a social situation, like, okay, yes, I'm against these alternative lifestyles without emphasizing that the reason why I'm against these alternative lifestyles is because my Bible preaches that they are wrong. And note that I'm still inviting everyone to accept Jesus as their personal Savior. Without the gospel being the primary focus of your stand in social issues, then you, what is the purpose of your opposing those issues? The primary driving force should be the gospel. And that's where I start. That's why social issues, political stands can be a distraction. I support this political party. Okay, why do you support the political party? And how is that advancing God's kingdom purposes. Because you as a child of God, your kingdom is not of this world. So you have to be very, very careful. I'm not saying don't be politically active. Choose whatever political candidate you think is going to advance your own interest. That's what democracy is. But take note that as a Christian, your kingdom is not of this world. So your primary responsibility as a believer is to ensure that you are taking people to heaven. And if in the process, any stand you have does not result in people going to heaven, then you really need to be very, very careful about that stand you are taking or even reconsider it because your fundamental job as a believer is to bear fruit. That's what Jesus said. But now I, I see we have a question. So go ahead. Yeah, Pastor, I have a question. 
Yeah, go ahead. Because these days, as Christians, you know, we, we are supposed to preach the word to, you know, to unbelievers per se. Yes. So, but some of, some, sometimes, like, when you're trying to preach to an unbelie un unbeliever, the difficulties I'm facing is some of them ask me, how do you know this is true? I say, because the Bible says so. So, and they start asking all these questions about the Bible, which is not very important. But what I'm saying is, what if, let's say, I have a friend who's in Canada, and he, he was in the U.S. military, and he's a very, very, he's a Christian. I know he's a Christian, because from his ways, his lifestyle, you know, we talk about the Bible every time, the church and everything. So, I think he has something like PTSD. Okay. So, he smokes synthetic weed. So, he smokes that all the time. So, I ask him, I say, hey. As a Christian, you're not supposed to be smoking weed because if you're smoking, you, you're telling me with your attitude and your lifestyle saying smoking is a good thing. But he said, um, God cannot judge him because it's medicinal. The doctor prescribed that to him. So I'm trying to ask if the doctor prescribed uh, synthetic weed to me right now that I'm going through a little stress. Can I, can I smoke that? Is, that? is that a good thing? Okay. The, the, the fact is that the Bible tells us that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. The truth about it, to, to answer your question, if the doctor prescribed the medicine to you to tell you that you should be smoking weed as medicine, you are not committing a sin if you decide to take the weed. No, it's the truth. When you look at it on the, from, on the surface value, if the doctor prescribed the weed to you and you want to take the medicine the doctor told you to, you are not you are not committing a sin by smoking the weed that the doctor gave you as a medicine. But the fact is that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. What I would do if I were you is I would seek to be delivered. That's why the Bible says I will not be held, I will not be, I will not be chained by anything. On the surface, it may look like, okay, it's all right for me to smoke the weed, but the truth as a believer is that what you should be praying for is that praying for healing praying for deliverance from that problem so you don't have to smoke the weed. Because the fact is that once you are, the same thing, you are chained to pain medicine, you are chained to um, 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 a lot of things that really, the Bible says that he who the Son of God sets free is free indeed. So to answer your question, that person is not committing a sin by smoking that weed because it's, the doctor prescribed it to him. But really, if I were en 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 engaging that person, rather than focusing on the fact that, okay, you are smoking weed, the weed is wrong. What I need to be praying, um, engaging that person is, I need to be praying for him and telling him you are delivered from this PTSD, you are healed from this PTSD, the power of Jesus can save you from PTSD. And I think that should be our approach to all these same things, like people who are smoking the weed because they are stressed. The Bible says, come unto me, ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, why do you need to be stressed? You are too blessed to be stressed if you are a believer. So, you don't need the weed. You don't need the alcohol. You don't need the drugs. So, that, is, I think, should be our post, that Jesus changes lives and allow the power of Jesus to transform all these lives. Amen. That's what my approach will be, both to a believer who is doing that and an unbeliever who is doing that? Praise God. So I think we've spent um, our time, we've gone a little beyond our time. So we're going to just bow our heads and pray. And ask the Lord that the Lord should um, bless each and everything that we have discussed today in the name of Jesus. And as a result of what we have heard, we will be able to go out into the world and bear fruit. That we will be able to engage the culture in such a way that lives will be changed. Father, we bless you. We magnify you. Thank you for helping us understand 
opening our eyes and enlightening us to the ways we should engage the culture. Thank you, I bless your holy name. I give you glory, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Put your hands in your pocket and bring out an offering. And um, we know the Bible says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So um, there are multiple modalities by which we give, you know, Cash App, Zelle, um, our church text to give number, our church app. Please um, give the Lord an offering as the Lord puts it in your heart and be cheerful about it. Let's not forget also tithes are 10% of what we earn or 10% of the proceeds of our business. And in this church, we believe in tithing, bringing our whole tithes to the storehouse. Praise the Lord. And let's not forget our building fund. God will give us the grace to develop this place we are. So I'll ask Pastor Sean to say a word of blessing on the offering and a word of blessing on all those who have given and all those who have come. And we look forward to having a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. This upcoming Friday, of course, is our house fellowship day. So information will be out on the church WhatsApp. Please look out on the church WhatsApp page for your group if you don't know it. And fellowship with God's people at 7 p.m. on Friday. And then, of course... Um, on Sunday, our service starts with the workers' meeting at 9.30 and search the scriptures, which is our Sunday school, at where we learn about the scriptures at 10 p.m. on Sunday and our worship service starts at 10.30. We we'll look forward to having a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, the Bible says the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the, to the simple. Lord, we are very grateful for everything we've been learning through this study. Lord, I pray that everything we have heard tonight would stay with us and bear fruit in us in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for every weakness and every uh, limitation to, our, um, to evangelism, either verbally or through our actions. Lord, I pray you remove in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that our impact will be felt in our neighborhoods, our impact will be felt at work, everywhere where we have the opportunity to interact with one person or the other. I pray that people will see Jesus in us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give, to give our tithe, to give our offerings, various kinds of offerings unto you. Lord, I pray that you accept our offerings and Sanctify it in the mighty name of Jesus and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, I pray for everyone here who is going through one thing or the other, Lord, one situation or circumstance or the other. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray for comfort. I pray for provision. I pray for protection in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, for our loved ones, Lord that are not in this service, Lord, that are going through one thing or the other. Lord, I ask that your hand that goes, that has no barrier with distance, that your hand will touch them, Lord, in Jesus' name. And that, Lord, you will give us a new song for every one of these ones in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that as we go, your Holy Spirit will be with us, that you Amen. take us safely home in Jesus' name, and that, Lord, you bring us again into your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. the love of God, Amen. and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.